Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Okay, let me see if I can um, share my screen and get the right thing up here. Hey, Marty. Right. <laughs> can you see that? Can you see no. it? No, not yet. Not yet. Is it coming? No, it's not. All right, let's back out and try that again. While you're doing that, if you don't mind, uh, I would like to uh, add the scripture from 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17. It's coming through now. All scripture is God-breathed okay. and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness Amen. so that the servant of God may be equipped for every good work. Lovely. Thank you, Collins. That just meshes beautifully with all of the readings today. Uh -huh. I, I appreciate you bringing Timothy to the meeting here. Okay, now let's, uh, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Good, okay. Um, Deuteronomy, as you well know, it's, it's part of our Pentateuch, the first, um, five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Um, it's also the Torah, which is the law of God is revealed to Moses. And um, I had thought as I was looking at all of these readings and there, there's so much about law that Collins really should be doing this one because um, I'm not a legal expert and I'm, I'm certainly not a religious expert, but uh, dinner at my house some nights is better than nothing, okay? So um, when we're talking about this, chapters six through 11, and we're in the first nine uh, verses of ch uh, chapter six, they read like sermons to encourage the people to obey God's law. And so, um, let's see, Margaret, would you read us the passage from Deuteronomy? Uh, yes, I will. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Moses said, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God char charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. And talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm going to start off, I, I put um, the verse numbers in here, so if you want to refer to something, it'll be easy to, to draw our attention to something, but if you go down to what looks like the second paragraph and look at verses four and five, um, these words are Israel's central confession of faith, that God is perfect in power and in oneness, and these two verses are a prayer that is known as the Shema, 
that's S H E M A H, and that first syllable is sort of m shma. Okay, um, notice it's known as the shma in Jewish tradition, and shma in Hebrew means here. Now, you know I don't know Hebrew, so I got that from somewhere else. But um, sh the shma is a prayer that's recited by faithful Jews twice a day. And it's a way of reminding themselves <laughs> of their promises to God. And it actually comes from three passages, of course, Deuteronomy 4, 6, 4, 5, and then Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 to 21, and also apart from Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41. And if you've looked ahead, you will also see it repeated in the gospel reading from Mark for today. Um, so let's uh, see what your ideas are on that and uh, what speaks to you or what questions you have. Well, I hear everybody else in here, so I'll jump in. <laughs> uh, not only does this identify the Shema, but it also highlights the fourth commandment. Uh, the fourth commandment is the only commandment that actually has a bonus in it. Most, we mostly think of the commandments of thou shall not and thou shall, you know, things to do and not to do. But the fourth commandment uh, talks about the promised land and it comes as a result of, if you will, as a reward for honoring thy father and thy mother. But the commandment doesn't just give a bonus of land, it gives a bonus of a long life. It, it, and that's too, it, the bonus of life, the bonus that it's a long life and that it's a good life on the land. And when you look upon the land that you live on, your home, your, your, whether it be in the mountain or in the lowlands, thank God for that gift that you have life on that land and pause and give thanks to God for your mother and for your father. Uh, and honor them by thanking them for passing on their faith uh, to you and to your descendants. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, welcome Al Alma also into the group. Yes, welcome Alma, glad you're with us. <clears throat> it's taken a while, <coughs> I still can't get my stuff up daddy but i'm trying but i'm i'm, I'm gonna cover me up <laughs> it's, it's not cute <coughs> sorry <laughs> well i'm <laughs> i'm thankful that we can okay, get together yeah. with, one, with one another whether we're coughing or not <laughs> oh it's just that i'm <clears throat> amazed at how ugly i am life is humbling so i'm gonna mute myself but listen <clears throat> Collins, you raised an interesting point, and I'm going to come back to it in um, a later reading, but you talked about the commandments, you know, being basically the thou shalt not, but that this one is what we should do. I'm wondering if um, in our laws today, um, and since you're an attorney, you can answer this, but anybody can chime in, um, are they basically negative or do they are there some positive things that that are stated in our laws well the fact that all of us are gathered together this morning at the same time to read and hear and meditate on god's holy word is one of the most positive she actually said it our laws. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, but my question was more about 
laws that the courts enforce? Are they basically thou shalt not types of things? Uh, for the most part, yes, because uh, intrinsically the laws are basically um, the man-made laws are guiding us on behavior that we should not engage in. Uh, most of man-made laws aren't, oh, love your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's put up that fence and put up a sign that says, trespassers will be shot. <laughs> And questions asked later. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, not not to bring us too far off the path here, but I'm thinking about things like the debate over vaccine mandates. Those would be a positive thing, you know. You you need to get your your shot. But um, of course, they have not become laws yet. Uh, and there are people who don't feel they should have to do that. But I got my booster, by the way, on Sunday. So um, I've been boosted. So what else do you see in this? Um, maybe look oh, yeah. at, I'm sorry, did someone want to say something? Laura. Yes. Anyone? I'll say something. It just okay, happened. say something. <laughs> <laughs> it delights me that when you pray back the word of God, that it is an extra impetus for that transpiring. And I love that from generation to generation, this will, will happen. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's quite a promise for us, isn't it? Uh, there are some, there's some good advice in verses six through nine, and I think, and I'm going to come back to these um, when we get to the gospel, but I think these are things that, that we really need to follow ourselves each day. Um, keep these words in your heart, recite them to your children, talk about them when you're home and away. When you lie down and when you rise, that's all the time. We're supposed to be talking about these things all the time. Then bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. I mean, that's pretty all-encompassing that we need to remember the words in four and five in so many different modes and places and times. Uh, that's... I think that's really good advice. Now, I'm, I don't know about how I can put them on my forehead, but any ideas on that? <laughs> <It's> no. <laughs> no. But if you observe them diligently, it may go well with you, for sure. Yeah, Ginger, I think that's right. And maybe it's not so much, you know, the physical part of our forehead, but our, our countenance. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the song, they'll know you are Christians by your love, you know, by what we are doing. I mean, maybe I won't have to get a tattoo up here, but, <laughs> right. um, you know, that, those, those words should remain with us all the time and, and should be, their effect should be visible to people we meet, right, in, in the grocery store, um, Oh, no, you go ahead of me. Um, I only have a few things. I mean, I have a, too many things. You only have a few things. You go on ahead. Um, you know, people often are shocked when I let them do that. Uh, yes, Collins, you need to unmute yourself if you want to say something. When you said to us to say something, that reminded me of the time when I was at a funeral and Rich was asked to say something and he got up and he paused and he said plethora and he sat down and the uh, pastor and you said this stood is. back up and said that meant a lot oh. Oh. <laughs> um, Rich, you're, Rich, you're going to have to catch up with him. <laughs> 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 
Well, does anyone have anything more to say about old Deuteronomy? And note, I am not going back to cats on this, okay? Even though as I was re repair, or preparing for this, I was singing and it became an earworm for me, but we'll just move on if you're ready. We'll move on to the Psalm. Isn't, isn't um, Ash Wednesday in the ashes a, an emblem on your forehead? Absolutely. Absolutely, Margaret. Thank you. And, uh, but that's just one day. And yeah. I don't know that I've seen people walking around with ashes except on Ash Wednesday. But mm. that's, that's a good idea. Thank you. That's a nice connection. Okay, uh, Psalm 119. You know, there are different types of psalms, classifications. This one is an instructional psalm about the glories of God's law. And the Latin beate immaculate means happy or blessed are the spotless or the blameless. Immaculate means without blemish or flaw, without spots. I'll have to tell you, my house is not immaculate at this point. <laughs> will be before Thanksgiving because I'm planning to do Thanksgiving here for the family. Um, but here it means the blameless as you see in verse one. And of course, recall the Beatitudes, happy or blessed are the, you know, all of the, the different ones. Um, Collins, you at one point had pointed out that uh, there are acrostic poems in the Psalms and this is one of them in which each line or section begins with a succeeding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, I don't know if any of you know Hebrew, but I certainly don't. So, you know, the acrostic doesn't apply to the English translation here, but that's just something that seems to be interesting to, if I could read Hebrew, and I believe it, when you're reading Hebrew, it reads from right to left and from back to front of the book. That's Does correct. That yes. So, I mean, that would be quite a challenge in, in many ways to, to figure that out. But I am going to ask the McConnells to read the psalm since we always enjoy hearing them read it. Happy are they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are they who observe his decrees and seek him with all their hearts. Who never do any wrong, but always walk in his ways. You lay down your commandments, that we should fully keep them. Oh, that my ways were made so direct, that I might keep your statutes. Then I should not be put to shame, when I regard all of your commandments. I will thank you with, in a, with an unfeigned heart, when I have learned your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Thank you. Beautifully done, as always. Um, I think this is a very positive psalm, but it mm -hmm. does give us some, some cautions. It's a, it's a way to tell us what not to do, but in a very positive way. And that's, that's quite a talent to be able to get um, a message across about what you're not supposed to do. But phrase it positively. Um, there's um, a lot of legal um, terminology in here. Uh, Collins, did you notice that? Yes. Still... <laughs> yes. What do you see as far as legal terminology that, that you deal with every day? Well, I deal with laws, decrees, uh, com uh, statutes, uh, judgments, statutes again. Uh, those are uh, uh, stock and trade. And, uh, like but more importantly than the quote focus on the laws, Laura, I'd like to uh, focus on the blessing. The blessing this Psalm, in particular, these first eight verses uh, have been identified as the blessing of obedience. We don't hear the word obedience or obey that often in our culture. 
it's almost uh, seems to be that a culture says, no, 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 no. I get it to do it my way. I did it my way. Uh, however, God is speaking to us through uh, the writer of the psalm that you will be blessed. You will be happy uh, in your obedience. And God goes to identify uh, how to obey, how the obedience, and it's, it's walking. It's important to note that uh, in those days, everybody walked, although a few people might have uh, ridden a donkey or a camel, but for the most part, the walk is important. And God is saying that uh, to the writer, you're blessed if and when you walk in a blameless way and that you can only achieve that blessing by walking according to God's laws. It's not like, look, the Persians have, you know, a, some, a real good code and or the, or the Romans or the Greeks or the uh, Egyptians. No, God gave the commandments to the Hebrews, to the Jewish people. And that was a very unique uh, blessing to them because it gave them, if you will, guideposts. It let them know, you know, in their walk, they won't fall in the ditch or off the cliff if they stick to walking blamelessly. Now, this, there are 10 things in this passage that this passage says, and I'd like to share them with you. I am blessed if my ways are blameless. I achieve blameless ways by walking in the, the law of the Lord. Wholehearted obedience is necessary for blessing. There's no unrighteousness in his ways. He gave his word so that I might keep it diligently. He did not mean for his word to be ignored. Six, I should develop a habit of obedience. It should be second nature to me. So that if my first instinct rather than it, so that it is my first instinct rather than something I make myself do. Seven, obedience brings freedom from shame when I look at his word. Eight, an upright heart breathes thanksgiving. And nine, my response to God's righteous judgments should be thanksgiving. And 10, God will not forsake his obedient children. Now, while I'm on 10, here are 10 things that the passage does not say. I have to look out for myself in order to get the blessings that I want. My way is the best way. I can obey him selectively and still experience his blessing. I can seek after my own way and still lead a godly life. A little unrighteousness is okay as long as I'm mostly following after God's will. There's room for my way in the Christian life. I can obey God's words whenever it suits me. Even if I'm living in obedience to God's commandments now, I can never be shame-free because of past sins. Nine, I should feel pressured and uncomfortable because of God's righteous judgments. And 10, God will forsake me. What this passage teaches me about God, he's pure. He desires are clear. There's no ambiguity in scripture. He blesses his obedient children and he desires our wholehearted obedience. Half-hearted devotion, not enough. Thus ends my insight on Psalm 119. Well, amen. That's good.
<laughs> yes, I, I liked all of that. Um, you did a good job in the first part in pointing out what's there. And I think it ties in nicely with the collect that you read at the beginning where we want to run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises. And then what we saw in the reading from Deuteronomy about keeping the, the commandments and being faithful. Um, and I, I love your, um, you know, what it does not say. <laughs> that, that I think we need to keep that in mind too, because it's, it's hard to slip into that mode. And um, I, I believe we need to guard against that. What do you folks think? I agree. Yeah, I do too. It's a good insight. Anything else that you see in the song that you want to point out? Okay, hearing it, none. It, it, we say this. it makes me think of the people who are being oppressed as Christians in situations where they lose their lives and how firm are we in our walk that we could still claim to be Christians as we are coming under attack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an excellent point, Mary. And, you know, the people who've gone before us, the martyrs, um, you know, we have to trust God to, to give us that strength if we are faced with a situation like that to be able to stand firm uh, in what we know he has promised us. So that's, that's a wonderful idea, Mary. Thank you. I think we have, we have enjoyed a long period in our country where the, the Christian faith was accepted as the as the uh, guiding principles for our country, uh, and therefore we were not under uh, we as individuals were not under attack. But uh, I see this uh, I see this changing dramatically now and. Uh, uh, the, the folks that come after us are going to have a, a much tougher road to hoe th than we do. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? All right. We're going to move on to Hebrews. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of background, which I'm sure you already know. Uh, this book was written for Jewish converts to Christianity. And while it was written to a specific audience, its content is relevant to all who seek to have a relationship with God, which would include us today. Its main purpose was to encourage Jewish Christians to stand firm in their faith in Jesus and not return to Judaism. And in the like manner, we too need encouragement from time to time not to waver in our faithfulness, uh, as, as Mary pointed out. Um, so it describes the many ways that Jesus and the religion of Christianity both fulfilled and surpassed the elements and practices of the Jewish faith. Now, the first <laughs> tabernacle is described in verses 1 through 10 of Hebrews 9. And it's then compared with the heavenly sanctuary in verses 11 through 14 and the forgiveness that comes with Christ's princely work. Recall last week's reading from Hebrews 7:27 that affirmed there is no need to offer sacrifices day by day because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice needed for our eternal redemption. So um, Ginger, would you be willing to read this passage? Sure. sure. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 11, 14. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls 
<clears throat> with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks to God. God. Thank you, God. And thanks to Ginger for reading it so beautifully. Yes. Um, in this, this letter, we clearly see that following Jesus is superior to any other religion or way of life. More importantly, because it's through Jesus that we have salvation. Um, I'm going to ask a question here. I'm just going to throw this out. How is Jesus' ministry superior? Superior. Well, it, the sacrifice doesn't have to be repeated. It's once for all. Whereas the old high priest had to sacrifice uh, repeatedly. That's one way. Good, good. Any other ideas about how Jesus's ministry is superior to any other religion? I'm not trying to turn us into Christian snobs. I mean, why do we choose to follow him? Can you hear me? Hello? Because, I didn't. because Anybody, it's in, inclusive. Absolutely. Anybody who wants to come to him, he will welcome. Yes. Great. Uh, Great. <laughs> I don't know how to work this. Anybody? Can anybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, Jesus is truth. And to me, it's like when people die, it's so sad. But if they're a Christian, we know they're in heaven and they're in a better place. And I've always wondered how do people deal with horrible things if they don't have God? Hello? That's a, a good question. Yeah, it's it's. I, I feel that we can face adversity <clears throat> much better because of our faith than those who who don't have that faith. And you had mentioned a better place. Well, Jesus is in a better place. He's at the right hand of God. Uh, and you remember the passage that someone said, well, and one of the disciples said, well, you know, where am I going to be? Am I going to be on your right or left? And <laughs> he gave a, a, a sweet Jesus type answer, but uh, it wasn't what the disciple wanted to hear. Um, how is the result of Jesus's ministry on our behalf superior? What, what does that do for us? How does it make us winners? Well, our faith says that he is a co... I'm, I'm not coming up with the right word, but in the Trinity, he is equal with God, is God in man form. And I don't know that any of I'm not familiar with every other religion but I don't know that other religions believe that but Good it point. is a strength for us yes yes thank you um think about how we might use this lesson to grow spiritually and to help others come into a relationship with Jesus you know and I think it's important if we are trying to bring someone to Christ uh, to make sure that that person knows that our Lord does not 
demand or expect perfection from us. What he expects and demands is faithfulness. We strive for perfection using Jesus as our model, our standard. And as we are faithful, God continues to forgive our sins because as it has been pointed out, that, that one sacrifice redeemed us once and for all. So we're, we're in pretty good standing, but have you ever thought about using a passage like this to, to lead someone to Christ? And it doesn't have to be this passage. Generally speaking, when we start talking about the blood of Christ to an unbeliever, it's, you get this like, whoa, <laughs> could you approach it another way? Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, if we were back in the days of Aaron and Moses, we would understand the significance of the blood and what the purpose of the blood sacrifice was. In Moses and Aaron's day, the, the blood was the blood of the heifer, the blood of the goat, uh, and th that was required for uh, their practice. Now, it, Jesus's blood that he gave, his sacrifice, uh, purifies our conscience. And when you are struggling today, when you're struggling this week with a matter of conscience, pause and say to yourself, thank you, Jesus, for your blood purifying my conscience. Those are wonderful words. That would be another one of those short prayers that we should say often throughout the day. Absolutely. But I don't think that anything people, else. Go ahead. I don't think that people who have not been exposed to the thought of blood sacrifice are going to receive that as unbelievers, as a truth that they receive and follow without some other instruction in how that does fit mm -hmm. salvation. That's right. Um, it, it might be uh, a little bit too much, as Collins pointed out, for that. You don't start off by talking about blood. Um, <laughs> although, that's right. If you can, you know, go through, and um, we're about to start the Gospel of Mark. One of the things I read that the uh, Gospel of Mark is a good first book for non believers or non Bible readers to read. And if you're trying to lead someone to Jesus, it might be a good idea to consider. Um, using the book of Mark. So. But I didn't want to leave Hebrews prematurely. Anything else that stood out to you in this passage? Alma, we had the um, ashes of a heifer there. So we're back to, to ashes again. Um, another type of sacrifice. Okay, well, let's move on to Mark, our gospel here. And um, <clears throat> this passage uh, describes the final confrontation that Jesus had. He had already dealt with two confrontations, which we recently studied. The Pharisees had asked about paying taxes and when they try to trick him into being unloyal to the emperor. The Sadducees, high priests and aristocrats, ask about resurrection, where they ask, okay, uh, our tradition is that if a man dies, the brother should marry the widow. So Jesus, what happens in the resurrection when they get to heaven? Who's, who's going to be the husband? And he, of course, he gives 
a very good answer and they didn't trip him up. But next he has to deal with the scribes. These are legal experts working with religious and political authorities. And the scribe asks a question and a little bit of background here. This is a really good question because at that time, they were supposed to follow 613 commandments. Ooh. And 248 of them are positive, what they're supposed to do. 365, the others are negative. And so it's logical that he would say, please, we've got so many things to follow. What's, what's the biggest one? Please let me in on that secret. Um, and so what he does, and um, I'm going to see if um, give Alma a heads up. Alma, can you read the gospel? Um, this one, this passage is known, of course, as the greatest commandment. Let's see if uh, Alma will be really willing to do that. But I can't get it. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I can't find the rating. I, I, I'm... Yeah. That's okay. Y'all, I'm not, I, I can be better. It says I'm in a safe driving mode, and, but I can't get the reading. Okay, that's all right. Well, I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and read it if, um, if you don't mind. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, a reading from Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that, he answered them well. He asked him, which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one. And besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Another great answer. And... You know, as it says, the scribe wants to find out which commandment is most important. So this passage includes the greatest commandment, which we've already seen in Deuteronomy in the Shema. Right. Yes, Jesus' Jesus's answer summarizes all of the commandments without diminishing any one of them. And um, the scribe then, which is, I think, a good Thing to do when you're learning the scribe repeats the words to impress them upon himself and hence jesus says you are not far from the kingdom of god i think those are words we all want to hear aren't they what what do you see here that that you like or that you question This kind of reminds me of something that Rich probably can relate to as a child. Uh, on Friday night, we tune in to TV to watch the Friday night fights. Uh, and this gospel that Mark's talking about is basically, as you identified, Laura, in your opening, is uh, a battlefield. And if y'all paid attention to the sermon on Sunday, it's us versus them, the, the great divides, uh, the scribes hearing the Sagittees disputing amongst themselves, the Herodians, uh, 
were in on that act too. The Essenes, uh, the, all of them were basically believers and followed that first command, but they were disputing amongst themselves. And here you have Jesus saying to the scribe something that I think is very significant. He says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And I'd like to, if you will, identify the word kingdom by dropping the letter G and getting the kingdom of God. Uh-huh. And That's so, good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And here's my next one. Well, I've got the floor, if you don't mind. <laughs> seven. There's seven of us watching and reading and listening. But there's also, and this will be, uh, I'm going to recite them to you. And at the end, I want you to examine how many of the seven are in you. It's a love test, if you will. The scribes basically given Jesus the love test. Okay, Jesus, can you get it? He says, I got it. I got it. I know it. I know it. She says, hear, O Israel. And he says, love the Lord. So the first love is the Lord. Right. Okay. The, now the second love is with your heart. Okay. So everybody probably has got a heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with all your soul, we all know we got souls. And with our mind, now some of us might be a little mindless at times, but we all <laughs> have it. Now, that, uh, that's Lord's one, hearts two, souls three, minds four, strength, strength, strength five. Now, Jesus doesn't stop there with the first. Jesus goes on to the next love, and he puts them together. Your neighbor. Now, in our current days, we might think that we're pretty isolated, but we really do have neighbors. They may be just a little far away, but they're still neighbors. All right. But, and Jesus is saying, hey, Mary, love your neighbor. But here's where most of us fail to see where Jesus is telling us to love. Rich, love yourself. Ginger, love yourself. Alma, love yourself. Margaret, love yourself. Laura, love yourself. Collins, love yourself. Mary, love yourself. We sometimes like to think, oh, no, no, loving ourselves. That's too self-centered. Whoa. Jesus is telling us, you know, at the end, love yourself. And that's my encouragement to all of y'all that you get all seven, the Lord, yourself, and in between, neighbor, heart, soul, mind, strength. And if you have all those together, you definitely will be blessed and your walk will be blameless. Amen. 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 And once again, Amen. Collins, you have tied this all together nicely. Um, good. I, I think you're, you're right. It's the one that's the hardest to say is loving yourself uh, because it seems a bit self centered or egotistical. But <laughs> I, I remember <laughs> hearing this issue dealt with in a sermon. And one of the examples was how when you're um, riding on a plane and you're taxiing and the um, flight attendant is up at the front demonstrating the safety measures and what to do if the oxygen comes down. And one of the things that's emphasized is you put your own mask on first before you put your child's on. Because most parents would want to make sure their child is okay. But if 
you're not okay. You can't help other people. If, you're, if you don't have your mask on, you can't help your child. So, you know, that's just a crazy application of loving yourself. But I think we have to love ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves because isn't that what Jesus would want? That's right. <laughs> so and what God else do make you junk? Well, Jesus does. Right. Jesus does give us a little guidance on loving ourselves. We're not to go overboard, but we're to, <laughs> if, if you will, we're to use a balance. And the balance that Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, which in a sense is saying, love yourself as your neighbor. In other words, don't love yourself more than your neighbor. Don't love your neighbor more than yourself. Good point. Keep it in balance in that low seesaw. Yeah, that's the, the nice little uh, teeter-totter, and, and I loved how your wrists were the fulcrum. <laughs> Excellent point. Excellent point. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, I wanted to uh, point out, yes, uh, the words from Deuteronomy okay. that say, you know, that Shema... Keep the words in your heart. We say to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and away. When you lie.